Well, uh, good, good morning to all of you uh, and good evening for those of us uh, in the U.S. Uh, I'm Shelley Schuster. I'm the president of the Keck Graduate Institute. And this is an opportunity um, for us, hopefully, to get a chance to, to talk to you, uh, exchange ideas, give you some, some hints from experts about uh, what the future is going to be, be in the biotech and life sciences industry. But one thing that I, I want to emphasize in, the, in this event is it is also an important celebration. Uh, we are celebrating seven years of Keck Graduate Institute working with uh, Biocon and the Biocon Academy uh, and their leadership and the leadership of the company. And it has been a remarkable journey and an incredible success. We have had seven years and 17 batches of students going through our programs. Never has a student graduated and not gotten a job. It is a remarkable and phenomenal achievement that is international, uh, that requires an enormous amount of cooperation and interaction between people uh, around the world. But what a testament to what we can all do when we work together. So it's really a, an exciting opportunity to celebrate, and I hope thank all of my colleagues uh, at KGI and KGI leadership, and especially thank all of my colleagues uh, at the Biocon Academy and at Biocon. It has been a joy to work with all of you. And my only note of sadness is that I can't be there personally to celebrate with you this evening. So I look forward to when we can do that, which hopefully will be very soon. Uh, but in the meantime, this is a celebration based on what we all do, and that is we're dedicated to bringing the benefits of the incredible science that's occurring to society. And there is no better time to celebrate that than now when we are still in the midst of a very serious global pandemic. Uh, and I have called upon some of my colleagues uh, to give some insight into uh, their view of the future and what the world might look like post-COVID. Uh, post so, I've asked my colleagues to to uh, talk for maybe uh, five, ten, or ten minutes or so about their view of what the their their uh, their specialty would look like in in the future, uh, and then we will have an opportunity to answer your your questions. Uh, and uh, I, I believe the best way to get them to us is through the the, uh, the chat function. We'll try to try to try to accommodate as many of those as we possibly can. I'm going to do lengthy uh, introductions. I will ask my colleagues to introduce themselves and give a little bit of their background. And I think that's that's as important uh, for you uh, to understand their pathways and their journey a bit, so that you can understand why they have such a such an incredible uh, and and uh, deep understanding of what the future is going to look like. It is shaped by their history and their path and their pathways. So let me begin. Um, I'm hearing a bunch of noise. I don't know if anybody else is. But okay, well, we'll just continue. Um, and let me start uh, by asking uh, uh, Jim Wittergren. Uh, uh, Jim is the, uh, the, uh, the retired chief of, of, of VP of, of uh, global at uh, or global activities uh, at Beckman Beckman Coulter, uh, and he is currently. Uh, in, in running several diagnostic companies, and in addition, in his spare time, he is the chairman of the board of the Keck Graduate Institute. So let me let me ask Jim to begin and uh, start this uh, start the celebration. Jim, thank you, Shelley, and Namaste to all our friends in India. It's really my honor to speak with you today for this celebration of the joint. KGI Biocon Academy. I remember when we were just getting it started seven or eight years ago, and I think it has been a tremendous success, and it really is great to see the uh, program develop into what I think is a model for international cooperation in educating the leaders of tomorrow in the healthcare industry and the life sciences. So I'm, I'm really glad to share some time with my colleagues and my friends and the Biocon students and graduates in, in India today. India is actually a favorite country of mine. I first visited uh, when I was a student more than 45 years ago, and I've been there many times since. And in fact, my parents uh, spent a number of years as teachers in India. So I have some some connection, and I'm always great to to speak with people there. The only thing I 
uh, feel sad about is the fact that I can't be there to share some Indian food with all of you tonight. But hopefully, post-COVID, one of the things we'll be able to do is, again, travel and interact a bit more. My background, as Shelley said, is that I was trained as an engineer, but I became involved in the medical diagnostics industry about 30 years ago. And I spent 20 years with a company called Beckman Coulter, which is a large uh, global diagnostic testing company, where I ended up running the global customer operations, which included India. And uh, it is been a fascinating area to be in. Most recently, the last five years, I ran a diagnostics company, a CEO based in Germany, focused on autoimmune uh, diseases. So my background really is in testing and the testing side. And I'm going to talk a bit today about testing in the COVID era and what I think we've learned for the future from what we've seen over the past year or so. So our topic is the biotech post-pandemic and the opportunities that uh, we can find there. To think about it, let's talk about what I think we are learning from COVID uh, over this period of time. First of all, pandemics can happen anytime and we need to be ready for them. We need to plan for them. You know, we've had pandemics throughout history. We've had plagues and flus and other infectious diseases, but the era of plane flights and globalization have certainly made it easier for these diseases to spread. And COVID has taught us that it can be difficult to identify, manage, and contain a pandemic that, and not only does it have an awful toll directly on human lives, but it clearly has a terrible burden on humans and society economically. So I think the first lesson here is that it will happen again, and we need to be better prepared for the future. Here in particular is where you students and recent graduates and professionals in the industry can really make a difference. You know, I think it really is an exciting time in biotechnology as our knowledge and our capabilities are growing exponentially. It's amazing for me to think that the double helix structure of DNA was only discovered less than 70 years ago, and that this insight has allowed us to develop remarkable technologies to understand and fight COVID. Now, I mentioned that I've been involved in the diagnostic testing industry, and we've been focused on developing tests, both molecular and antibody tests, to uh, accurately diagnose and monitor patients who've been infected with COVID. And this is difficult because you want to ensure that the tests are accurate as possible, but you also have to balance the time that it takes to get results, the cost of the test, the difficulty of running the test, the difficulty of manufacturing it, and how do you distribute it. No test or medicine is of any value if you can't get it to the patient who needs it. And it's of no value if they can't afford to have the test. So we have two many major types of tests that are being used today for COVID. In general, they're the molecular PCR-based tests and antibody or antigen tests. And they, fund they differ in some fundamental ways. The molecular PCR tests usually use a swab of the nose or saliva, and it looks for the molecular signature of the COVID virus. It's a very sensitive test, but it can take a relatively long time to get results. Usually needs to be done in the lab and it can be expensive. However, it's the best way to determine that you're currently infected. The antibody tests look for antibodies in your immune system that have been created to fight the virus. Antibody tests can be a lot faster to run. Some are called rapid tests, but it takes some days for your body to produce enough antibodies to be detected. So they're not as good as an early indicator. 
However, the antibody tests help us understand how well your body's developing protection from reinfection and if you're building a long-term immunity. And how well we build a long-term immunity is one of the big questions around the vaccines that are coming out today and how effective they will be. With antibody tests in particular, we're working to develop more sensitive and more specific tests. Sensitivity is a measure of how well a test detects a small amount of a specific virus or bacteria. So when someone says they have a 95% sensitivity for a test, it means that in 100 infected patients, you'll detect 95 of them, but five of them will be falsely shown as being negative. A false negative means you're infected, but there's not enough virus in your system to detect it. Specificity is whether you're detecting the specific disease you're measuring. For example, a specific coronavirus rather than another strain of coronavirus or something else like a flu. So you have a danger of a false positive saying that saying the patient has coronavirus when they in fact have something else. So we had a lot of trouble in the early days of coronavirus test development to determine the sensitivity and specificity of these tests because we had trouble actually getting enough samples from infected patients to test the accuracy of our tests. Unfortunately, that's not a problem today. Now the problem today is too many people infected, obviously. So testing's getting better, but it's not perfect, and we have a long way to go. However, a study was just published yesterday from the University of Colorado in Boulder, which shows that mathematical modeling of data that test turnaround time and frequency of testing are more important to contain a pandemic than the sensitivity of the test. So it's important to get tests and use them more frequently. This brings to mind a couple of final points for the future, which I think should be of interest to you, the current students and alums of BioCon and KGI. I think COVID has taught us how interrelated all of the life sciences have become. We are all learning to work together better, whether it's universities and research and training, pharmaceutical companies, which are developing critical drug treatments and vaccines, uh, diagnostic companies and testing manufacturers uh, and manufacturers manufacturing both products and personal protective equipment, government and the private sector organizations, and the brave doctors and healthcare workers who are treating the patients. In addition, the technology will continue to evolve. We are learning the importance of data. We are learning that big data, artificial intelligence, improved understanding of the spread and transmission mechanisms of viruses, and the workings of our immune systems are becoming more clear. There's incredible amount to learn and apply. You know, we've learned a lot in the last 70 years since Watson and Crick, but there's a lot that we can't even imagine today. And I personally am very grateful to have had a career in the life sciences where my work improves the health of people around the world. I'm really excited when I see young people like many of you wanting to make their own career in the life sciences. For there's an old saying which goes, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Thank you, Jim. Um, inspiring words and a, and, a, and a great vision for the future. Let me next introduce uh, Dan Bradbury. Uh, Dan uh, was the former CEO of Amelin Pharmaceuticals. Uh, he's now the uh, executive chair of Aquilium, uh, and he is a member of the board of uh, Biocon. Uh, and of course, uh, in, in, in addition, he is a uh, member, longtime member of the board of the Keck Graduate Institute. So it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Dan Bradbury. Thanks, Shelley. Um, I have to tell you, I'm just super excited to be uh, talking to everybody this evening that, uh, who've been involved in the Biocon Academy. Um, I think it was um, probably nine years ago now, I think when Shelley and I first had a conversation about uh, 
by Khan Academy and the opportunity uh, for creating, um, you know, a really um, innovative learning opportunities for people uh, within the biotechnology industry and particularly uh, at, um, at, uh, at Biocon. So just a little bit of background uh, on myself. So I've been, uh, you can probably tell by just looking at this new uh, blonde hair that I have. Um, <laughs> I've been in the biotechnology industry uh, for uh, I should say pharmaceutical biotechnology industry now for just about 40 years. I actually started in the industry before I went to university uh, in the lab and um, uh, have been uh, working mainly in the pharmaceutical industry and then joined a biotechnology company first in 1994, um, which I ended up running a company called Amelin that uh, Shelley mentioned. Uh, we sold that company in 2012 to, uh, to a Bristol Myers Squibb and AstraZeneca. And since then, I've been mainly focused on doing board work. I joined the Biocon board in 2013. Um, having worked with Biocon for many years prior to that, we had a collaboration um, at Amelin with Biocon um, when I was at Amelin. And uh, knowing, uh, I guess, Kieran now, uh, the founder for uh, close on uh, I know, close on 20 years, I would say, probably now. Uh, but uh, also doing board work, consulting, but also investing in the biotechnology industry. And uh, what I wanted to spend uh, just a few minutes talking to you about uh, today is really what's going on with investing in the, in the biotechnology industry, just to give you a sense of just the magnitude of uh, the amount of human, uh, sorry, I should say a uh, capital that's being deployed today in the biotech in industry. I will, uh, you know, I'll apologize for uh, the fact that I'll give you some statistics today that are mainly focused on the U.S. as that's where I have most of my access to the numbers. But I will mention a few things that are also going on in India that I think probably are important to everybody who's been through Biocon Academy. So just to say, you know, three kind of questions that, you know, I wanted to kind of talk to you about today is, you know, um, one is... Um, at what's been going on on biotech uh, for the last, uh, I guess, uh, 10 years now um, is, um, is there's just been an increasing amount of investment in the biotechnology industry. And uh, so one question is, is there still upside, um, you know, in biotech investing? And what are the key ingredients that are actually going to drive uh, investment outperformance? And there's also, as Jim was talking about, some of the lessons learned in COVID-19. Well, there's some very interesting lessons, I think, learned about COVID-19 and the pandemic that we're all having to live through um, in terms of what that means for, for biotech investing. So to just give everybody a bit of perspective uh, with regards to kind of where we stand today with regards to biotechnology and biotechnology companies. So if you go back 20 years, in 2000, um, you know, here in the United States, there were 8,021 U.S. public companies. At that time, uh, there were only 66 biotech or life science tools or diagnostics companies. So that represented 0.8% of all public companies in the United States were focused on life sciences. Today, uh, actually, as a result of consolidation, there are 5,000 397 com public companies in the United States. But of those 5,397, 479 of them are biotech, diagnostics, or life science companies. So that now represents 8.9% of all public companies in the United States are actually life science companies. So that's a greater than 10x increase in the proportion of companies that are public companies in the United States, which are now focused on life science. And this upswing in terms of the proportion is actually accelerating. If you actually look at capital formation in our industry, um, you know, biotech is very much driven by innovation. And um, if you look at kind of what that um, uh, uh, innovation has generated as a result of capital invested, um, What's actually happened in the last 10 years in America has been that there has been 415 initial public offerings. There has been uh, 1,200 
follow-on offerings, raising over $202 billion that has gone into the life science industry. In fact, in 2020 alone, just in IPOs, that's initial public offerings in the US, it's been $23.3 billion raised. So these are like staggering numbers. I mean, if you, if you think about that. Um, but also in the last 10 years, there's been 420 new drug approvals. So $202 billion has resulted in, in investment, has resulted in 420 uh, new drug approvals. And, um, you know, Steve will tell you in a moment about the, uh, the uh, cost and the challenges of developing new medicines. Um, but, you know, an interesting fact is if you just do the simple math on that, that works out around about half a billion dollars to develop a new medicine, um, which actually is down from what it was uh, about 10 years ago. And part of the reason for that is the war. The increase in the uh, use of uh, diagnostics and the increase and in focus on what we call today precision medicine, right? Uh, where we actually um, better understand the molecular biology that's behind the disease and develop a medicine that's specific to that understanding of that molecular biology. So when you think about that, um, is this going to continue? Well, you know, the, what drives the cycle of innovation and what drives the cycle of investment? Well, there are kind of three things. One is access to high quality science and research. And frankly, the reality is that we're seeing better quality research and better quality science today than we have ever seen in our, our lifetime. Um, I think it was just over 10 years ago, somebody said, um, we talked about the fact that we're in the golden age of, of, of life science at the moment. And, and that is absolutely true with gene therapy, cell therapy, RNAi, immuno-oncology, conjugated monoclonal antibodies, stem cells, low cost, high speed gene sequencing, um, and you know, biosimilars, all of, all of which are actually resulting in uh, greater availability of new medicines uh, to people, which is driving an increased rate of innovation. So that's, that's the first one. The second is access to strong management teams. This is the reason why we have Biocon Academy. You know, the, <laughs> you know, the reality is we need uh, people who have really strong management skills and actually understand this business and can actually enable um, the uh, transfer of that research into uh, the creation of new medicines and or diagnostics and or medical devices and life science tools. And then the other, the third one is access to capital. And I can tell you today, sitting on the sidelines in the US, and this is true in Asia as well, across uh, India and in China and in other parts of, uh, the, the, of, of the world, there is just huge amounts of capital looking to invest in life sciences. And the reason for that is because people are, what they're seeing is how that today, this new technology that we have, the access that we have to great research and great science is actually creating value for people. And that value, of course, is worth something, right? So, um, so that's where that's going. I would actually argue that today we are still very much at the beginning, uh, the early innings of the, of the biotech cycle. So just to bring that home to you guys in terms of what does that mean in terms of what's really going on in terms of, um, you know, how is this uh, access to capital and investing in life science impacting what's going on in your lives today? Well, just look at what's happened this last year to Biotron. There's been more than $250 million of new capital has been invested in Biocon by Goldman Sachs, by Tata Growth Capital, and by True North as part of the Biocon Biologic strategy to access the capital, uh, public capital markets. That's a strategy that's available today because of the of, of how people see the value of the uh, creation of uh, sorry of creation of medicines by similar medicines in particular, which will drive greater affordability um, of medicines um, globally, and uh, Biocon's role in that. So uh, that's uh, you know I guess what I had to say today, but. One of the things I would, I would say to you is that the industry that you've committed to learning more and more about, in my opinion, is really still very much at the beginning of its growth curve. Thank you, Dan. And and clearly, the, the I, I, I couldn't agree more 
This is the beginning of the uh, beginning of the cycle. Nowhere near the end, and it's it's never been more exciting. I think, and I agree. That science is better. The opportunities are better. So, thank you for that that great summary. Uh, l let me now ask uh, my colleague, Dr. Sue Behrens, uh, who is a professor at at Keck Graduate Institute. In addition to being the the director of the Amgen Bioprocessing Center at at KGI, uh, and she comes with a long background in industry in bioprocessing and production. And uh, with that, Sue, uh, take it away. Muted. You're muted. Yep, realize oh. that. Sorry, too late. <laughs> it's okay. Too I late. did start talking, but I guess I benefited from uh, what Daniel was just explaining. The uh, the growth of this industry um, has really. I've been lucky. Um, to be growing with the industry throughout my career. And um, it's been an exciting part of, uh, you know, opportunity really to have a job that is changing all the time and is allowing us to do new things for new people. And I'm really um, excited to be included in this opportunity to celebrate Biocon. I'll tell you my, uh, I don't have a lot of experience yet myself with Biocon. But our big news is um, we have our first um, Biocon certificate graduate who is now a part of our Masters of Engineering program. And I looked to see if she was on the uh, list of participants, but shes I don't see her there, and that's probably because she's sleeping because she does the night shift and taking classes with us right now. So we're hoping to get her over to the U.S. sometime soon. Um, but I appreciate what Biocon Academy has done and, and an excellent student. Um, so clearly, a Biocon Academy has been successful. Um, my background, I actually started um, working at Merck uh, after I finished my graduate degree, and I worked there for um, a little over 20 years and had the opportunity to work in bioprocessing, in fermentation, um, large-scale fermentation, as well as then transitioning into more biotech fields. I also worked in drug product doing uh, injection um, filling and finish for uh, syringes and vials. Um, so I have a broad-based experience. My passion is vaccines, so the timing is kind of good, but it's actually been my passion for 10 or 15 years. Um, I really like it, honestly, because it's hard, because vaccines are not easy, and so it's a challenge, and it's fun to think about how to apply technology and manufacture them. So manufacturing um, is often the last thing that gets thought of when people are discovering new medical treatments, and we have to catch up. Catch up. So we do that by um, trying to stay ahead of the curve on technology trends, trying to keep an eye on what our medical partners are doing and what they're developing so that we can be ready to manufacture those products when it comes. And right now, we talk a lot about the three pillars of medicine. So there's the original pillar, the molecular models. So we have the small molecules, and even the larger biomolecules are still molecules. So it's still molecular type medicine where we're able to characterize our products and make a product um, one at a time. In the When you start moving into the gene therapy space where you're actually changing the genetic material of the patients you're trying to teach, it requires a whole different kind of product. And then finally, um, cell therapies are a different kind of product as well, where we either change the genetic material outside the body or inside the body of a cell, but we're looking to change how the cells operate. And honestly, um, in looking at those three pillars, vaccines kind of fall between gene therapy and cell therapy, depending on the kind of product they are, because we're trying to change the way the cells operate inside the body. And so we have been doing this a long time. A lot of things that seem new are actually kind of old, but um, they are, we're applying those principles into new opportunities. So being able to help with CAR-T, the biggest learnings for helping in manufacturing of CAR-T are things we've learned in vaccine manufacturing. So bringing to scale uh, cell-based manufacturing is really dipping into the learnings that we've had through vaccines. And when we start to talk about stem cells and potential regenerative medicine, um, that's a, another area that requires a, a lot of in-depth um, understanding of both the science and the engineering for how to grow these cells and how to provide cells that are 
regularly made the same way because consistency and quality is the most important thing in our deliverables as a manufacturing organization. So um, I wanted to just kind of talk high level about what in bioprocessing is changing and where is it going. So um, the, in order to do that, there, you kind of have to think about what bioprocessing is. And there's really three main components, cell growth, bioseparations, and then the final product that's being delivered to the patient. And so if you think about cell growth in production, we've gotten very good at large scale mammalian cell growth. And we are growing in 20,000 liter uh, bioreactors, um, cells that have been modified to pump out monoclonal antibodies or other proteins. Um, we still use a lot of microbial fermentation um, to make insulin and enzymes and other products. Um, and those would continue to get more important. The DNA, RNA vaccines are often made using microbial fermentation. So we, I think, are going to see more of those now that we're seeing vaccine data that says that platform um, is likely to work. So what's going to change? What's changing? Actually, it's interesting because we spent all our time trying to get bigger and now we're trying to get smaller again. So we want to make our product very efficiently. Um, so we want to make our equipment smaller. So well, we learned a lot about how to scale up. We're trying, we now talk about scaling out. How can we make lots of smaller pieces of equipment rather than one huge piece of equipment? And can we use single use technology? Can we use things that can be replaced every batch so that we know that they're clean and that they're going to be, um, the uh, ch turnaround time can be faster. We can buy and build a new facility much quicker. We would not be into manufacturing vaccines without the single use advancements of the last 10 years for COVID. So um, it's really important, the single use transition that we're making. However, um, if you read the literature, you'd think almost everything was going to single use and that's all we were ever going to have. We still have 95% of the world capacity for manufacturing biotech is in stainless steel um, large scale equipment. And that's because the bigger pieces of equipment really dominate. So another way that we're looking at getting smaller is with continuous manufacturing. So if we manufacture in a continuous mode, we have the ability to run continuously all day long. So we don't lose the night and the, the um, turnover between different batches. And so we can have much smaller equipment that makes the same amount of material. In often makes even better material. The quality tends to be more consistent because you have generally um, cells that are in the same growth stage and material that's at a steady state, which often you don't have in the uh, environment of a batch reactor. So it's, a, it's actually a step forward in a lot of different ways. And so continuous is really important. And then the integration of those things is important. How do we put all the steps together? So I've been talking mostly about um, cell growth, but bioseparations and the product delivery are also really important. And so how do we make sure that the bioseparations and the product delivery are connected as well to the system and that we could maybe even run them all at the same time? Is there a way that we can run all of them at once? And so that's something that we could look at uh, to try to find out um, how, how we can put things together. So that's um, one of the other uh, options in our area. Um, so the other last piece, the product delivery, we're thinking about new ways to deliver product. So it used to be we say, you know, yes, you can have any kind of product you want as long as it's in a vial. And then we got really good and said you can make any kind of product you want as long as it's in a vial or a syringe. So that was our advance. So now we are looking at can we get to um, different kinds of deliver of devices to deliver materials? Can we do implantable um, devices? Can we do um, what are called microwave patches for vaccines, which are very small, tiny needles that can deliver the vaccine directly to the skin cells that are very responsive from an immune point of view? Um, delivering from a nasal delivery for a lot of respiratory viruses is really effective for vaccines, which you can imagine, right? Because that's where the product is is infecting the body. So it's best to build the immune system through that pathway. So all of those are, are things that are being thought about, which will add new manufacturing challenges. 
So if we figure out how to do those things in the lab, if we figure out how to scale down and get continuous and integrate and, and then bring in the uh, um, different kinds of delivery systems, can we make them? Can we make lots of them in a, a rapid manner? So those are all really important aspects um, for trends actually in the manufacturing area. But there's a couple things outside of manufacturing too. So manufacturing is, we think of it as being, where do we put the bolts together? But in reality, there's this whole system around it that it doesn't work if you don't have it. If you don't have quality labs to do the testing, if you don't have a system to read the batch records and approve them, if you don't have our uh, colleagues in regulatory to make sure that we're getting approvals and getting material out, do we have warehouses for incoming materials? Do we have warehouses for outgoing materials? All of that has to work together in order to be successful and to, to make progress. And where we're seeing... Um, I think going after COVID with those things is really getting a lot better at data management and bringing all that data together that moves things more smoothly and efficiency, efficiently through the process. And in addition to that, um, I think, you know, back to what Jim was saying, you know, we are going to start seeing that companies are always already doing this, but are ensuring their supply chains are more robust and understanding that there could be a, a global disaster. I'll tell you, we used to plan when I was in industry, we would plan for outages, but we never planned for the whole world to be out. We planned for an outage of this plant or that plant. And, and of course the response was, well, well, we'll shift stuff over to this other plant. But if the whole world is, is in a disaster, it changes your response and your risk management plan. And so I think that's gonna be an outcome of this as people productively um, looking forward and building strategies that allow them to respond more quickly. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, um, but I'm excited to talk more. I could talk for a long time about this, but uh, glad to hand off back to Shelley. Th thank, thank you, Sue. And and obviously a lot of excitement in the manufacturing and production and supply chain and all these areas are just I don't know if the right word is exploding, but certainly expanding in need and complexity and uh, uh, wonderful opportunities for young people and real challenges out there. And I think you've outlined them beautifully. And I know folks are going to want to ask you more about them later. Uh, but m moving on, l let me let me uh, uh, introduce Dr. Steve Galson. Uh, Steve is currently the Senior Vice President of uh, Global Regulatory Affairs and Strategy at Amgen. Uh, and he brings a really unique uh, experience set as well to that position, having been the former United States uh, Surgeon General. Uh, so uh, l let me let me give Steve an opportunity to talk about all of the world and regulatory affairs. Steve. Thanks, oh. Shelley. And uh, I'll just say, in addition to that role, I also managed the drug part of FDA. So it's really a pleasure to speak to you for a few minutes to celebrate the impressive history of KGI's collaboration with Biocon. So congratulations to everyone who's led and participated in this impressive program. I want to talk a little bit about our adaptations to COVID that the industry has gone through. And this pandemic has, has hit home for me as uh, two of my children are emergency medicine doctors and they're working with COVID patients every day. Um, so far, so good. Over the last few months, we've seen health authorities around the world come up with creative and necessary solutions to enable drug development to continue even in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that. We've learned some lessons from these adaptations and we've begun to envision how some of them may transform from temporary solutions and they, during a global crisis to permanent standards that we apply to a wide variety of clinical trials and regulatory affairs under normal circumstances. As many of you know, Amgen's a global company with a long history in biotech, and after 40 years, we're still growing. Our mission is simple, to serve patients. We do this by addressing unmet patient needs in grievous illnesses and by bringing a deep understanding of the role genes play in disease to our search for medical breakthroughs. 
Amgen operates in over 100 countries, including 14 in the Asia Pacific region, coordinated out of our regional headquarters in Hong Kong. We've invested heavily in the region. We have uh, many Amgen contract employees around India, and uh, we're working to develop local capacity as well. We operate a next generation manufacturing plant in Singapore, which is providing world class manufacturing some of the aspects that you just heard about and ensuring quality and supply. And we also have a research and development hub in Shanghai. When the COVID-19 crisis began uh, late last year and quickly spread around the world, the response, as you know, was an attempt to limit the spread of the virus. The result was, for a period of time, progress on drug development through clinical trials came to almost a halt in many parts of the world. However, as the scope and the scale of that crisis became more evident, we started to understand that COVID-19 was going to be around for quite some time. It became clear that as a society, we couldn't sacrifice patients suffering from other grievous illnesses in order to slow the spread of COVID-19. Thus, health authorities around the globe began exploring how drug development could continue while minimizing the risks from COVID-19 for patients, healthcare professionals, and the regulators themselves. The result was a series of what we've started calling adaptations, temporary changes, uh, that sponsors and health authority staff working from home, limited travel opportunities for patients, and various other measures that were put in place by public health authorities. While this practice has been available to patients, um, oh, excuse me, for some, for some countries have allowed investigators as well to conduct follow-ups and to monitor patients via secure telemedicine portals. And this practice has been available to patients for the treatment of various ailments for many years. Regulators still expected these monitoring sessions to occur in person for clinical trial participants. So faced with the risk of COVID-19, it became clear that for certain trials, such as those for simpler conditions, telemedicine was an acceptable alternative. Similarly, many countries still require hard copy paper submissions or wet signatures for a variety of regulatory tasks. Some of these countries have either waived these requirements now or temporarily deferred them to eliminate the need for sponsor and health authority staff to come into direct contact with, an, with each other. Certainly not all of these adaptations are appropriate for all clinical trials. For example, direct patient delivery of investigational products does not work for medications that require intravenous infusion. However, these adaptations can and should continue to be supported by regulatory bo bodies going forward, even when the pandemic has ultimately passed. Our experiences over the past few months has shown that this can be done without increasing risk to patients or impacting the integrity of clinical trial data. Let's pause a minute and think about what this might look like in the future, focusing on a patient. Imagine a future where a patient who is a candidate for a cardiovascular clinical trial can have many of their interactions with the investigator team remotely. Perhaps the particular patient we're talking about lives in a rural area far from the primary investigational site. The initial screening visit can be done via a secure telemedicine tool that connects the patient with the investigator. This eliminates the time and expense of the patient traveling to the site. The investigator walks the patient through the informed consent, and then the patient is able to further review that document from the comfort of their home. Once the patient is comfortable, he or she electronically signs the form and requests electronic notifications via text and email whenever the consent form changes. To establish the baseline for the patient, orders for blood work and, for example, an EKG are sent to a lab near uh, the patient's home with results sent directly to the investigator. 
Upon receipt of these baseline data, the investigator can then arrange for the investigational product to be shipped directly to the patient. Perhaps along with this, the patient also receives a wearable device that captures heart rate and blood pressure, automatically sending this information along with responses to the patient reported outcome survey to an electronic clinical outcome assessment tool. In this scenario, our patient can participate in the trial without having to travel to the clinical site. Data are captured more quickly and efficiently for evaluation, and it's easier for the patient to stay engaged in the trial for its duration. These ideas that I, that I suggest are intended to foster and maintain the important connection between the patient and the physician, even when an on-site visit isn't practical. Furthermore, the technology to enable this scenario is already available. In fact, each component of the scenario from the telemedicine to the electronic consent form and even the direct patient delivery of medicines is already available in standard medical practice. Amgen has initiated over 1,200 direct patient investiga investigational product shipments with the capacity available in 45 countries. If a patient is not able to make it to a site visit, we bring the product to the patient, often in tandem with home health nursing where needed. We see the value in sustaining this option post COVID as a means to minimize the impact to a patient's day-to-day -day life. Monitoring of clinical trial sites is also very, very important in trials. And this has traditionally been done by contract research organizations uh, doing detailed source data verification in person. During this pandemic, this has been impossible, but sponsors are nonetheless responsible for in ensuring the integrity of the data. This has led to increased adoption by the industry of various remote monitoring approaches that have been slowly gaining approval uh, over years. They've sped up now. Remote monitoring where clinical research assistants conduct monitoring visits and data review versus uh, via online platforms and statistical monitoring where algorithms identify outliers that may point to a struggling site or other risk factors. MGen has leveraged this type of monitoring since 2012, but obviously now it's been accelerated. We intend to continue to develop and further mature these remote trial conduct oversight capabilities guided by robust risk assessments. The final vision I want to share is not really about the future. It's very much about the present in countries around the world. The electronic submission of documents and the remote electronic conduct of inspections by health authorities. Electronic submission is now standard in major pharmaceutical markets. The benefits are obvious. Not only does the sponsor not need to print truckloads of paper, uh, and bring them to health authorities, but the reviewers can access this information from anywhere that has an internet connection. While many countries do leverage these electronic gateways, um, COVID-19 is bringing to light one final hurdle to fully electronic submission that many countries have not removed, the requirement for wet signatures on certain documents. Given how far the industry has moved, it's difficult to understand why these requirements are still in place. Experience has shown that sponsors of, are doing remote inspections can result in more disciplined, more focused communication between sponsors and inspectors, driving more useful out, outcomes. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced industries around the world to find new and creative ways to continue operating under restrictions we never could have imagined one year ago. The pharmaceutical industry is no different and the adaptation that health authorities have introduced over the last eight months have enabled sponsors to continue their pursuit of potential life-saving therapies for patients with all number of diseases. Many of these ideas had been previously suggested that coronavirus is merely the forcing function that has caused regulators to try them. As a result, we've seen real world evidence that many of these ideas not only work, but are more efficient 
and more effective than the traditional way our industry has operated. Going back to the way we've always done things should not be an option, even once the threat of COVID-19 has been mitigated. Thank you very much. Steve, thank you. What a, what a wonderful uh, what a wonderful way to sort of capture all of the other advances uh, and bright future that uh, that our colleagues have been talking about. Um, we we have a couple minutes. Bindu, I've I've seen a bunch of of, of questions uh, flash through. Do we want, we want to like pick two? Uh, how would you, how would you like to do that? Because I know our time is limited. Uh, and we can certainly explore the ones that we don't get to, which will be most of them. Uh, if you'd like to to pick about one or two, and we can direct them at some panelists. And and uh, again, thank everyone, and uh, and move on, and and hopefully talk more with the students at a later date. Sure, sure. I just uh, pick up some questions from the chat. Uh, so this is for Daniel. It says, uh, dear Dan, as James, James was mentioning, pandemic was was there and will be there. Do you draw parallel with biotech investments from a startup perspective? I'm sorry. Could you say that one again? Sorry, uh, I didn't. Did, yeah, yeah, I broke up a little bit, Bindu. Yeah, oh, okay. sorry, I didn't. So uh, this was like, do you draw parallel with biotech investments from startup perspective? From Tata's perspective. <laughs> well, uh, so actually, it, it is interesting from Tata's perspective. Uh, 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 sorry, Daniel, about... it is. Startup, start I think. Is, is that what start you said? Was it? Yeah. Startup. Yes. I, I, I think the question I saw on the chat was that I had mentioned that we've had pandemics in the past, we're going to have more in the future. So the fact that there will be more to come. How does that affect startups and opportunities for startups? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, great question. So, uh, clearly, there are, well, okay. Um, I think there's a, a couple of things there. First and foremost, I think, uh, I mean, Jim mentioned in his, uh, you know, presentation, I think thinking about kind of the, the value of, um, uh, certainly of diagnostics in terms of managing um, pandemics going forward. But I also think, you know, one of the things we're kind of looking at here now uh, in terms of interventions with regards to potential future pandemics is a, a greater focus on um, uh, antiviral as, as well as um, uh, immune modulating uh, therapies um, and considering the, you know, the potential impact uh, of um, uh, future, uh, so I guess, uh, unknown viruses that are likely to occur going forward. Um, I can tell you personally, uh, so uh, I actually invested in a company, uh, what, uh, two years ago, which is now trying to develop a pan, a, a broad spectrum antiviral, which would treat multiple respiratory viruses and take potential mutations of SARS. So while today we're looking at, you know, SARS-CoV-2, we obviously have had other SARS, um, you know, viruses as well, but the, you can actually, you know, model um, somewhat likely um, permutations in the future, uh, what might be possible. And, uh, uh, so I would say that there certainly is a market for that. And uh, one of the things that is very clear if you look at kind of governmental responses to uh, the pandemic in terms of uh, the amount of capital that's been made, made available to support research into uh, drugs to treat the pandemic, I think you're going to see even more uh, made available going forward to actually uh, stockpile somewhat op opportun uh, opportunities for interventions against future pandemics. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. So there was a question we, yeah. from Sampriti. This is for uh, Steve. It's for you, Steve. Uh, she has mentioned, as you mentioned, drug development in this COVID situation has led to a halting of drug development of other major diseases. Will this continue as the same, or there will be another pressurized situations for industries to run parallel strategies for both COVID drug development and drug repurposing along with other sectors or diseases? 
So what happened with clinical trials around the world is that they slowed to a crawl or a stop in the spring, but they have slowly restarted around the world. And, you know, unfortunately in the United States with what's going on with COVID, they're slowing down again, but they've, they've, they've re regained much of the enrollment and much of the momentum that was lost initially. So I expect that in the long run, this is going to stimulate more efficient drug development, will enable uh, companies and organizations to um, be more efficient in the way that they conduct trials. Less in-person interaction should speed things, but we've got to get through this pandemic first before that acceleration uh, can occur. But at least at Amgen, and I know from the other companies that we've monitored, uh, we're still not up at 100% uh, capacity, but a lot of the trials have restarted. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Steve, uh, let me, uh, it is uh, uh, 7.30. I want to honor the uh, the time commitment we asked for from, from my colleagues, and I want to thank them all. Uh, but I also want to just, again, take a moment to thank all of you in, in Biocon and the Biocon Academy and all of you students who have participated in these 17 batches and batches sh still to come. Uh, we, we in the uh, United States, I'm gonna wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving holiday, but there's a lot we all have to be thankful for. And certainly our friendship, our, our wonderful relationship, the ability to work together and be so successful working together. And hopefully all of you are, can be thankful as well for staying healthy and being healthy. But most importantly, I think we all share the vision and the, the, the gratitude for being part of an industry, part of an environment where we can all say we made a difference and we're going to make everyone better and healthier and happier. So uh, congratulations to uh, my colleagues in Biocon and the Biocon Academy. Uh, thank you to all of my colleagues uh, here in the States and the, the panelists as well. And again, I look forward to seeing all of you and doing this celebration uh, in person as, as soon as we possibly can do that. So thank you all and uh, and have a good uh, have a good day. Thank you, Shelby. Cheers, guys.